How socially intelligent are you? Does that even matter in this day and age? Well, let's hold that thought and approach a diversity and inclusion strategist who's here with us today at the Winning Side Suite. To discuss her approach to be the change, make the change, and leverage the change. The Winning Side, a series of dialogues about winning themes such as diversity and inclusion, creating a social impact, and leading change. Subscribe now to stay in the know. Hello and welcome to the Winning Side Suite. This is your host, Sarah Hassan. Absolutely delighted to be here with the season two of the Winning Side. Our dialogue today is all about social intelligence and its books. This is one dialogue that really calls for an in-depth coffee session with your wider networks. Social intelligence, what is it really? And why is it the talk of this dialogue? I would let the expert take the lead on educating us on this one. Today, I'm here to learn, explore my voice, and fill my thought process bank with some solid takeaways from the very inspirational Kelly Cooper, who joins us all the way from Canada. She's the author of Lead the Change, CEO and founder of Center of Social Intelligence and a DNI strategist. Kelly's experience spans across science and engineering to playing a pivotal role in policy making. She was a part of the Canadian delegation for United Nations meetings where the world first united to address gender diversity in the 1990s. Each step of her career was faced with challenges in the workplace from sexual harassment to pay inequity. She eventually overcame all these by diplomatic clarifying boundaries finding her voice, and working with the leadership to affect change. Well, please join me in welcoming the very inspiring Kelly Cooper. Hello, Kelly. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks very much for having me here today, Sarah. Absolute pleasure to have you here. And I'm super excited to connect with you personally because I read your book, Lead the Change. And that left quite a mark on me, I would say, especially on the side where you mentioned your personal journeys, that really hit a chord. And that's exactly what I want to talk about and explore today with you. I'd love to hear your personal journey behind this entire setting up of the Center for Social Intelligence and behind going into the diversity and inclusion journey, really. So you're wondering how I got to this place in the first place? <laughs> So I guess where I started was really looking at environmental issues. So I've now been working for 30 years in the space of sustainable development. And for those who don't know what sustainable development is, it's, it's really not compromising either the environment or social issues in favor of the economy. And so for the first 20 years of my career, I looked at issues like climate change, where people were trying to understand how to do that. How do we not compromise the environment for the economy? And nowadays, obviously, climate change is a much bigger issue and um, people are paying greater attention to it. And we're trying to quantify things like the, the cost of air. So things that are like mind blowing uh, 30 years ago. So I was heavily involved in that uh, line of work. And after a period of time, frankly, I was very tired of the old boys network within that sphere of work. And I wanted to understand and explore the social side of that equation. So I knew that here in Canada, we have... Um, often given funding, for example, to Indigenous organizations who'd like to participate in a pipeline project. And so we would give funding to help them have a voice at those, um, those meetings where those decisions were making, taking place. But I didn't see that as a return on the investment that, um, that I think people are often looking for. So I wanted to understand what that meant. So it's about um, how do we get a return on the social aspect of our business? Well, it didn't make any sense. Right? So I did a little research on that and I started to realize that it's really about how do you get the most out of your staff? How do you get most out of your employees and get them to perform optimally? So I started to do some research in that and it, it launched me into the diversity and inclusion space, really with a focus at the beginning on gender diversity and trying to get women into more senior executive roles in um, any C-suite company, 
like any company in the C-suite level and in the technical positions themselves. I'm in the natural resource sector, so I've really focused in on mining and forestry and energy. However, it does apply to all sectors. Wow, that was a long journey and um, not surprisingly so. But what really hits a chord again is the fact that, you know, from sustainability to going to diversity and inclusion, where does social intelligence come into the picture? What is social intelligence and what are the perks associated with it? So I define social intelligence is when an organization acknowledges, addresses and invests in the social dimensions of an organization, such as gender diversity and inclusion. But I also include things like mental health and intergenerational issues with the goal of increasing productivity, health and wellness and the bottom line. And this is achieved by giving individuals in an organization the necessary tools and skills to develop themselves to create a healthy and sustainable work environment for everyone. Thanks, Kelly. In your book, you explored more about social intelligence. You mentioned that there was quite a few companies and clients that you researched with. What do you think was the key missing piece in the puzzle? The economic imperative of diversity inclusion is pretty clear with all the researchers out there. But why is it not given the importance that it should be given, really? Well, it's a good question. Um, so you're basically wondering, why has there not been greater uptake on this issue? Yeah. 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 Well, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but it is it is about the economics and people believing that there is a need for that change. Um, I talk a lot about in the book about the need for diverse points of view. And that's really the crux of the matter is we have two parts to diversity inclusion. Obviously, one is to have a diverse team comprised of more than just the standard cohort. And, and um, I know it's un men often get feeling uncomfortable about this, but it's not meant to isolate uh, white men, for example, it's more meant to strengthen their uh, ability to innovate and perform by having more diverse points of view at the table. And so when you look at, say, a company that produces a certain product, they're not going to get the maximum intelligence uh, about that product as they affect their key markets or clients if they don't have diverse views at that table. So that strengthens their ability to innovate, to be competitive, and those are the things that people don't seem to understand are critical to sustainability in their organization. And that's a very key point that you mentioned, you know, bringing men on the table as well, because, again, I'm, I'm quoting you from your book where you mentioned that diversity is for everyone. And, and that's that's very fair. So we move on to from kind of making the business case for diversity to how to actually achieve it as a as mm -hmm. an executive coach and then as a DNI strategist. How do we bring men on the table and how do we ensure that we are not working in silos, really? How do we handle disparity? So I guess part of it is, is explaining the economics of it, obviously the innovation and so forth. But it's also to show the benefits that men will also accrue, accrue from such a, a shift in the workplace culture. And so things like there's a lot of perception out there that, oh, well, if I create these work-life balance policies, for example, um, it's all going to tailor toward women and they're going to be you know, sloughing off work or cutting out and not, not performing. But in fact, it's, it's something that is not the case at all. I, in fact, the pandemic has proven this. People are at home, they're juggling family and work, and they're actually working more than ever. And men are seeing this too. They're finding that they also are able to engage with their families in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do so. So with the workplace life policies, for example, if we're back out of the pandemic world, back in the office environment, it applies to men in the sense that they are also able to have flexibility with their schedule without being seen as not wanting to move up their career ladder. They're, they're not going to be seen as slacking off. So if they need to go out at four o'clock, for example, to watch their son or daughter's recital or, or, or a game, they can do so without feeling any retribution from that. And that's really important for them to understand is that, oh, okay, this actually applies to me too. I don't, uh, it's not just giving somebody special favors. So that's really important. I think the other piece of it is, it's just the social dynamic of it. By having greater social cohesion for men, there's less likely of the suicides, there's less likely of the death gap. There's a lot of connections now between men dying sooner than women because of the stresses they incur as a result of the work they do, the lack of social connection that they have. So there's a lot of pieces there that we don't normally look to that need to be brought into the equation in this conversation. 
at the end of the day, it's it's about what I what I take away from you. It's about creating that safe space and creating a psychological safety for all. And you're very right because recently I was in a conversation with a colleague. It was very interesting because he was like, "Oh, can you take this work away from me because I'm going on a on a on a leave?" And I was like, "You're going somewhere nice." And he's like, "Yeah, I'm going on a parental leave." And for a second, it didn't kind of click onto me. Like, oh, okay. In my head, I was. I was struggling to process it. I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's just two weeker. Maybe it's that. But when it actually said parental week on this calendar, I was like, oh, wow. And that's what diversity or creating safe spaces brings. That's a joy that a lot of men perhaps wanted to enjoy, but couldn't earlier. That's right. And they don't seem to have a safe space to raise those points of view because of feeling ostracized from their peer group, right? Yeah, and that and that creates that problem. I know in the natural resource sectors in particular, there's quite a an issue there. I think for um, creating a safe space to raise things that are occurring in the workplace that uh, men just aren't comfortable saying anything about. So if you're doing um, offsite work, for example, um, there's a lot of um, cowboy behavior that takes place, and both men and women will tell me that. Uh, so it's no secret. But it's like. Uh, the, the sort of code of conduct for behavior is pretty low, let's just say. And um, although if you bring in new policies to create better standards for women as the focus or the, the target for why these things are changing, it actually benefits men as well. And now that I'm uh, really delving into that space, I'm hearing more from men about how it benefits them too, but they really didn't want to say anything about how it was an issue for them because I didn't want to be singled out. A good example of that is um, a guy I know, he's an executive guy and his wife was home pregnant. So this is an offsite stuff. This is actually corporate world stuff. And um, he had to schmooze a client um, and the client wanted to go to a, a gentleman's club and he did not want to go. He, he felt very uncomfortable going. Um, you know, his wife's expecting his baby soon. It just was very awkward for him. But he, he felt compelled to go. He felt they had to go. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't feel there was a choice. Mm -hmm. And that was really like, and, and when we had this discussion, um, like it was quite an open, vulnerable share of information. He actually said he never told anybody that before. And I found it very striking because, you know, he welled up with tears and he said it was really uncomfortable. And I, I should have, I should have said, no, we're not going. Yeah. But I went. You know, if we had a policy in place where these sorts of things aren't expected or allowed or what have you, that would have given him that opportunity to professionally bow out of it. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in, a, in the sense, because it wasn't there, he felt obligated and was and it was uncomfortable. Now, a lot of guys will listen to that and go, yeah, yeah, sure, he was uncomfortable. But I think there are a lot of men who would feel uncomfortable in that situation or at least awkward. So I think we have to recognize that there's um, a need to create, although women are the target for the purpose of the conversation starting, I think what we're learning over time and men are understanding over time is there are a lot of benefits to them as well. And these are these are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. That's very true. And these are situations that I can personally relate to as well, right? Because we are, we're often in situations where it's so hard to say no, or so hard to kind of assess whether it's a safe space or not. So is there like a secret sauce to identify whether a particular say, uh, space is safe or not? Or do we have to rely on policies? Well, I think it's about creating a culture where people feel accepted and comfortable to do as they need or want to do. And, and these examples that I'm giving are targeting that. I felt really close to with your, your personal journey and the way you handled stuff, right? And there is a mention of how you built a code of conduct within your home. And that's very, mm -hmm. that's key. I think one doesn't realize that it starts from the home and goes all the way to the corporate world. So I'd love to hear more about how did you, you know, kind of implement it at home? <laughs> well, there's putting up your tenets of behavior, your code of conduct, but then there's enforcement of those, right? So it's, it's, and a lot of companies have started out in this space just saying, oh yeah, I got the policy. I'm good. Yeah. But the truth is, is that's not enough, of course. And you need to be enforcing whatever you're saying. You need to be, uh, committed as the leadership toward those tenants or codes of conduct behaviors. So at home, it was the same thing. It's like I put them right up on the fridge, you know, 
respect your siblings. You will respect your parents. Jeez, I can't remember all that I had. It's been a while since I wrote it. But there are many things where it's just like you need to adhere to the rules of the home. Um, you need to apologize when you've stepped over the line. And when you saw that behavior not being adhered to, you have to uh, gently remind them of these uh, these tenants that we have and uh, bring it to their attention and be committed to that as, a, as the one running the household and just making sure that they understand that this, this behavior is unacceptable. Mm-hmm. And I think we don't do that enough in the workplace. We, you know, people get by, bysta- it's called bystander syndrome where they witness stuff that is just like not on, whether yeah. it's a, a joke that's inappropriate or whatever, and they don't know what to do. So it's almost like letting the leadership, like having the leadership be very clear about what the behavior is expected in the organization. That becomes the culture. And then that becomes a safe space. So that if anything is offline, people can comfortably call it out without um, feeling too awkward. Just like, hey, you know what? That's not part of that. That may be something that's good outside of the office in your world. But in this in this environment here, this culture here at work, that's not uh, how we do things. And, and you can just do it in a very um, diplomatic way. You don't have to be rude about it. Yeah. In fact, that's the best way to be is not rude about it. But you just got to gently bring people along to recognize that uh, this culture is um, is different than that. And that creates comfort for those who have been targeted in that discussion. Very true. And as, as you mentioned, diplomacy, it's easier said than, than done, really, right? Because there is the bystander syndrome, which is on the extreme end. And then there is the, uh, you know, calling it out really loudly or really explicitly which is the other side and it's very it, i think it's key to be diplomatic and that's where i think social intelligence comes in and that's where your emotional quotient comes in i i have been a part of a bystander standard syndrome and i think we all have been so uh, and this is very early in my career there was a uh, there was a senior there was a lady in the senior management team she got married I could hear inappropriate jokes in the office around where people were saying, ah, okay, so when are you having kids? Or now you'll have kids, will you take a break? Will you will you take a break from work? And at that point in time, I didn't really know what to do about it or how to handle it. But to anybody listening to the sounds of it, it was clearly not safe or it was clearly not the right thing to say. And from that, my ask really, or rather an advice from you really would be that Say, for example, if one is stuck personally or is a bystander to a situation where you feel there is um, a known disparity, be it a pay gap, a uh, gender pay gap, or be it an unfair incident you, obs- you one observed, such as harassment at work, what's the best way to manage it in a very socially intelligent way, for the lack of a better word? Well, if it's a woman who's concerned about a pay gap scenario, um, I can definitely draw from my experience on that where, and I do speak about this in the book, about how I had heard that another consultant had been brought in on the same project, uh, a different aspect of the project, but equally as important. And he was having the privilege, in my opinion, to have the client's ear 24-7, basically, because they were men to men and calls could be had at any time. And so there was that kind of almost past the client consultant relationship almost in a friendship level right yeah that had been uh, that would have been created and when I found out that he was making twice as much as me and I have master's level degrees and um from good univer- very good universities mm-hmm. and I had uh you know 25 years of experience there was no reason for that disparity and so I went directly to the boss uh, the client and I just said listen, uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. So I, I spoke with him. I had assertiveness would be the EQ skill here to, to speak up and uh, one-on-one and just to say, hey, my understanding is this person's getting twice as much, uh, yeah. but I'm an equal player in this team and I don't understand. Can you explain why that's the, the case? And he said, well, you know, he can contact me any day. He calls me on weekends, at nights. And so he's always on the job, Kelly. And I said, well, I'm always on the job too. And if I were to call you on weekends and at nights, I'm pretty sure your wife wouldn't like it. (laughs) And he just, well, it's assertive. 
It's yeah. sort of, and being diplomatic is being discreet in the sense that you're not saying this in front of a group. Yeah. You know, you're not looking to embarrass anyone or call yeah. them out in public. I don't think that's appropriate, yeah. but it is appropriate in my mind to have a one-on-one conversation and to be assertive about that and make it clear with your story on why you think this shouldn't be the case. And from that conversation, things changed. I, I immediately got paid double what I was paying. Wow. So it was worth speaking up and being assertive. And to your point, it didn't just benefit you. It benefited the ones after, I'm sure, as well, because, I mean, you said the mm-hmm. record straight, right? Yeah. In fact, there were other women who they didn't weren't privy to that conversation, of course, but they saw how I was able to work with the boys network. Yeah. And that probably is a result because I, I have three three older brothers. Um, and so, you know, I kind of knew more than I ever wanted to know about what guys think of girls and um, growing up. And um, it was very difficult to get airtime and all that sort of thing. It, it probably provided me with a skill set I didn't even know I was acquiring during those years. And it's that ability to speak up and to be logical, don't be yeah. emotional and very clear with what your purpose is in raising something and do it with confidence. Yeah, I think that really did add value to what you are today. But my two takeaways and very nicely put by you are A, having a one-to-one really makes a difference and being assertive about it really makes a difference. A funny meme or joke that I kind of came across the other day was that somebody tell me how to argue without crying, because that's again a lot of a lot of females or I'm again stereotyping here, but a lot of people with who are struggling with emotional quotient sometimes need to clear their thought or need to take a step back, clear their thought, have a one-to-one and be assertive about things rather than be very emotionally involved in things. So maybe disconnecting Mm -hmm. from from your personal feelings is key as well. Definitely. I mean, it's not like I wasn't in my earlier days, probably more emotional. Yeah. Um, But I have learned that that's really useless to be. And if you want to get your point across, then you have to put that aside. And just really think through what, you know, have some self-awareness. That's another EQ skill, right? To have self-awareness to know what your vulnerabilities are and make sure you're not putting your chin out there and with your vulnerabilities first. Be sure to be, um, just be objective. Indeed. There's no conversation uh, that we can have without talking about the pandemic. A recent study by um, Institute of Business um, uh, Management stated that gender equity is still not a top priority for 70% of global businesses. And with the with the pandemic surrounding us literally and being there, is this mm-hmm. yet another excuse for corporates to kind of say, okay, now's not the time to talk about DNI. Let's just focus on the numbers elsewhere. Or is this the right time to talk about it? Oh, wow. Yeah, no, this is definitely the right time. I, in fact, I think this has really been an amazing time that we aren't even understanding how it's benefiting this conversation yet. I think there's a lot of people who are quite negative about how all this rollback for women. And I appreciate that a lot of women were cut who were like from jobs because they were in the service sector. But when you look at what's going on in the home, never before have men had to be um, on the front lines of the home front uh, as they have in the last 18 months. And I think there's greater respect and awareness and understanding for what it takes at the home front than ever before. And I know there's some, <laughs> some guys I've talked to and they're like, Oh my God, I can't wait to get back to the office. <laughs> you know, I can actually drink a cup of coffee while it's still warm, you know, and they appreciate, I think their spouse much more than they ever did. I also think that, and I learned this when I was working in the mining sector more fully, that when there's a downturn in any way, as there can be the boom bust cycle in mining, that the, the the bus cycle time is the same storyline. Oh, it's not a priority right now. It's not a priority. I said, actually, this is the exact time to do it because as you reopen and re-engage more fully, you're going to be better equipped to embrace the diverse and inclusive mindset uh, that's required in a culture to help you innovate, perform better, create better business outcomes, all of that, the business case that people always talk about you're going to be better positioned. So what the time now is, is to uh, onboard some uh, skills and knowledge acquisition about how to do that, because it will only strengthen you as you move out of that 
So I would feel the same about the pandemic. It allows the time more than ever so that when you re-engage in a fully way, in a full-on way, you're going to understand the, the importance of diversity and the importance of an inclusive culture mindset so that you have optimal performance. Indeed. And one may say that the pandemic has increased the level of self-awareness and awareness of gender roles around us as well and how how difficult or challenging it can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It from from there, we talk about the way forward as a DNI strategist. I know this is a very tricky question, but uh, and there's no straightforward answers. But what what would your top tips be for a company or a leader who wants to incorporate a DNI strategy? I would have to know more. It's all contextual, right? Where are they on their journey? Because there's a spectrum of of a starting point. If you're right at the beginning, you've just got a policy, and that's all you have then you got to start making it real. Um, and there's a ton of things, and I mentioned them all in my book, about what leaders in particular need to do. And it starts with being that role model and committing to a change and starting to weave the DNI into your business strategy. So it becomes embedded and as part of the, uh, yeah, the DNA of the organization. So you start to do more visible talks about the topic, about the, sh- the change that you're looking to make how that looks for people, because as with any, any change, people, most people don't want change, right? True. And they can't handle it. And, and with these DNI things, they think, oh God, you know, here comes another policy that's going to try to go through and then it doesn't go through. So there's, yeah. you know, there's just not enough commitment behind it. Right. So commitment is really key and for leaders to be visible and talking all the time about it and how it weaves to the business and how it contributes to their bottom line. They have to constantly do that. That's part of their role. So that's part of the be the change aspects that I write in my book. And then it's all about how to embed it into your policies and procedures. And there's a whole process for doing that as well. And it's about creating a team across the organization who can help you and be the eyes and ears for you on this topic as it rolls out. Because you're you're essentially talking about uh, as I mentioned, a change management initiative. So yeah. it's about how do you create awareness on this issue and then create their desire to make a change. And once you've gotten that under your belt, then it's all about how do we roll out the proper training and skills acquisition uh, to help people to be the kind of cultural group or organization that you're aiming to have. So there's a whole process there. Um, I can't get it into all of it now, but there's quite a bit there, and I encourage people to um, to look at my book, frankly. I thought, it's funny, you know, I wrote this book, and I was like, I don't know if people are really going to want to hear this, what I have to say. And it's been an amazing and humbling experience because people like yourself, but also the targeted audience I have, the C-suite guys, they're responding to this book. Like, I'm getting a lot of calls where people are saying, Kelly, I've never heard it articulated this way, and now I get it. And that just, you know, that makes my day, right? It's just like, oh my God, it's, it was, this is worth it. And I would Because every totally day is, is a journey, that. right? Yeah, I would totally second that because, you know, you hear a lot about DNI, but it's the way you articulate it or approach it and then kind of embed it or infuse it with your personal experiences. That's where I found the book to be kind of, you know, really inspiring, really. And I, I well, mentioned this in our earlier conversation as well. Like as I was going through the book, I could say, "Ah, oh, oh, I've seen this. Oh, that that's happened. Ah, that's how you deal with it." <laughs> and that's like, um, that for me was magical. That that the reader can go through that process of, ah, I know this problem. Ah, this is how you know. This is how it's linked to the bottom line, and this is the approach. So the flow was very well well thought of. Thank you. Yeah, I feel that. Um, and as I get further into this, uh, sharing this book with people, people are saying to me, Kelly, this should be on every um, academic readers list, you know, yes. in this in, in the MBA programs, the business programs, not uh, like I, the book now sells in Canada um, at our national chapters uh, stores across Canada. And uh, it's in the business and leadership section. It's not, you know, social issues section. Yeah. And I think that's been the real thing for me in this whole journey is um, I read books prior on all of this and I just either they were very academic Mm. or just, I don't know what to say, very feminist. Mm. Um, But they didn't connect with the 
key audience, which is yeah. men. Yeah. And it's like, hey, you know, we can, when people get mad, oh, well, you can't just talk about economics on this, Kelly. There's a whole social side to it too. And absolutely, that's that's kind of the obvious part, right? Yeah. That's been going on for hundreds of years, but yeah. nothing's changed, right? So how do you make that change? Well, that's where I say, well, that's where you have to talk about the economics. Indeed. And your audiences can include, you know, there's not just economics in this book, obviously. It's it's kind of, uh, it's got the social side of it too with my EQ skills and all that stuff I talk yes. about. But um, there's something there for everyone. And I guess Indeed. what I'm saying is it now opens itself up to an audience that wasn't reached before, which is the C-suite. Indeed. I would let the listeners experience the book by reading through it and then all the comments would be welcomed and they'll come straight to you. And as we uh, come towards the end of this uh, dialogue, what are the parting thoughts you'd like to share for uh, policymakers or leaders? I guess I would like to tell them that uh, change is possible. Change is real happening right now. Like I lead a national sector-wide project in one sector. I won't get into which one right now. If you want to know more, you can look me up on my website. Um, but, you know, approaching this issue by sector is very effective. And we didn't talk a lot about that today. We talked more about the book, but the work I'm doing right now where you can bring together leaders from across the sector, the public, private, not-for-profit, indigenous and academic academia working collaboratively, sectorally on this issue of diversity and inclusion, that makes a change happen and stick. So it's not a one-off. It's not like, oh, this one company is doing something. And, but it's managed to be harnessing all of this energy collectively and getting everybody rowing in the same direction as I always go on about. And that's effective. And so I guess I would say that change is coming. This is not going away, this issue. Better to learn uh, about the economics, get yourself educated on how to make it real in whatever organization you're in, whether it's academic or private or public. I have all these clients right now who are all looking to do it. And it's very exciting to see. Yeah, I, I just encourage, I encourage people to, to embrace it and, and enter their conversation with curiosity. And they're going to be amazed at what comes from it. And embrace we shall. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. This has been an absolute pleasure. And I, I think I have taken back so much to think about, to, to explore more, to explore the economics of it, to find my voice in how to be more assertive and um, kind of build up on my EQ. And I'm sure the, the listeners will be taking that away as well. Thank you so much for your time and for all your uh, wonderful the thought processes that you shared with. Thanks for having me, Sarah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's time to design, create, and build an inclusive club. If you enjoyed this dialogue, Please share it as a care gift with your friends, family, and wider network. Your feedback is what makes this dialogue inclusive, really. So do subscribe and engage on the podcast platforms, YouTube, and Instagram handle. Until next time, ciao, ciao.